just wanted to introduce Professor Brumnack, uh, who's really been nice enough to create a number of these uh, monthly presentations that we've been putting on. Uh, and this one is really special. I've seen a lot of the pieces of it on the evolution of digital logic. So, um, uh, you all, welcome to Professor Brumnack. And thank you. This is his birthday, by the way. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. And don't forget, an expert is somebody who started before you. So when you finish, you're all going to be experts. I like to dedicate this. Uh, lecture or this little presentation to uh, Professor Sidney Sansky. Uh, Professor Sidney Sansky uh, started at Queenborough in 1969 and he retired in January 2008 and unfortunately uh, he uh, passed away last Friday. So you'll see a lot of things in the school that uh, we're due to Professor Sansky. If you know any of his students, you know how dedicated he was. One of the things that he uh, produced, and I would like you to take a copy of and read it, and heed it, is uh, this little pamphlet that's entitled, What It's Like to Be a Technician. So, read it and see what you think. Okay. All right, so uh, what is electronics? And the idea of electronics is that uh, it's a uh, branch of physics that really does something, does things for you. In engineering, there's a saying that there are no solutions, there's only intelligent alternatives. You can't really solve anything, but you can always choose the best or the better of, of the alternatives. And electronics uh, lets you do that uh, intelligently. We have, uh, we have this uh, evolution, uh, and mainly in, in, in size and function. And uh, I have for you here, uh, let's see. The wrong one, sorry guys. I thought I would uh, help myself and put them down here, but uh, it isn't the case. Okay. There's a book by these two gentlemen, uh, Haskell and Hannah, if you care to look it up. And uh, instead of uh, me going through this research, I let them do it for me. Okay. That's another thing you have to learn about engineering is that, especially electrical engineers, always take the path of least resistance. <laughs> so if it's done, don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. But you do give credit to the person that, or the people that do. So here we see, can you see this? No? Can I make it bigger? Okay, this? Okay, thank you for seeing Oh, even that would be. How do I go up now? Okay. Everybody see that? Okay, let's go back to 3000 BC. No microprocessors, no, well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it did happen. Okay, Abacus, Babylonia. Use column of beads and wires to represent digits. Okay. Still used. Uh, then we jump to 1614, 1600s. John Napier, Scottish mathematician, invents the logarithm, exponents. Okay. 
and it allows to multiply by addition, divide, division by subtraction. He invented something that he called the rods, the number of sticks that allowed you to multiply and divide. I guess it was like a forerunner of a slide rule. Yeah. 1623, Wilhelm Schickhardt, German professor, first mechanical calculator, <coughs> called the calculating clock. In 1630, William Orthred, English mathematician and clergyman, slide rule. Yeah. And uh, appropriately, uh, Professor Sonsky was a great uh, fan of the slide rule. 1642-1644, Blaise Pascal, French mathematician, physicist, religion philosopher, invented something called the Pascaline, was the first mechanical calculator that became pretty much uh, well known. 1672-74, Gottfried Willem von Leibniz, you know this uh, gentleman here, German mathematician, diplomat, historian, jurist, inventor, invented differential calculus. There's a, a controversy whether it was Leibniz or, uh, or Newton. And they probably did it independently. Okay. Invented a mechanical calculator. He called it the step reckoner. And on a unique gear, the Leibniz wheel, a certain mechanical multiplier. It never really worked, okay, but uh, <laughs> It was a major influence in future designs. 1823-1839, Charles Babbage, English mathematician and inventor, began working on something called the difference engine. And it was designed to automate the process of calculating logarithms, etc., etc. And he was about 100 years ahead of its time uh, in terms of the precision, the gears, etc. Babbage is considered to be the father of, of computing, Charles Babbage, 1820s. 1854, George Boole, English logician, mathematician, he published the investigation of the laws of thought, which gave a mathematical basis for logic. Well, he didn't know that. You see, uh, Char uh, George Boole was hired by the French court to uh, design games. You know, the aristocracy there was getting bored. And they, he designed card games, he designed board games. And he designed uh, a set of rules, logic rules, and it was a parlor game. He would pose a problem and everybody would have these rules, and if you follow his rules, you could solve this problem logically. You came to a conclusion. Now, he didn't know he was doing this, see, because eventually, you see, this became the mathematical basis for logic. In 1930s, uh, what was the guy's name? Uh, Somebody help me, don't forget, I turned 66 yesterday. Yeah. Uh, It'll come back. Yeah. Anyway, he, he, was, he, was doing a, uh, he was doing his PhD at, uh, at MIT in electrical engineering, and uh, he was working on switching circuits for uh, Bell Labs. And one of the courses he had to take was the history of mathematics. And within this course, they touched on Boole's laws of thought. And being an expert in switching circuits, he said, wow, so this is amazing. These rules represent logic circuits, represent switching circuits. So from then, from then on, he uh, we use, we use a Boolean algebra to represent these uh, switching circuits. But as you can see, it was strictly by coincidence. 1890, Herman Hollerith, American inventor, used punch cards.
cards tabulate the 1890 census. He founded the tabulating machine company in 1896, eventually in 1924 it became IBM, the International Business Machine Corporation. 1906, Lee the Forest, American physicist, invents the trio of three electro vacuum tubes. These tubes would not be used in computers until the 1940s. Okay, you can see right here the, the distinction between uh, linear or linear electronics and digital electronics. You can see it, it didn't go to digital until much later. Okay. It was uh, an analog form here. Uh, vacuum tubes we used for amplification and stuff like that. It didn't go into switching until much later. 1936, the gentleman here, Turing, English logician, published a paper on computable numbers. Okay, and he invented what is, was called the Turing machine. And if you go for higher degrees in electrical and computer engineering, you will study the Turing machine. 1937, George Steinitz, physicist of Bell Labs, build, build a binary circuit using relays that can add, subtract, and multiply in the line. Okay. And to illustrate some of this stuff, I have actually built three, uh, one circuit in three different time periods. And this is a modern version. These are relays. This is a modern version of a relay. There's, each one of these has two relays. So you see there's 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's 22 relay enclosures. Each one has two relays. So there's, uh, there's uh, 44 relays needed to solve a particular problem. Okay? And at this time, you would solve this problem this way. And the problem is that you input four bits. Okay, one bit is worth eight, one bit is worth four, one bit is worth two, and one bit is worth one. So if you want to say seven, you need a four, a two, and a one. You add these weights, okay? Here's a nine, okay? Eight and one, okay? Okay. So uh, these switches will represent this so-called binary coded decimal, and these relays will translate it into what we call a seven-segment display. Because you see, ones and zeros are very non-friendly. To the human eyes. If you want to say the number uh, zero, for example, you would say uh, nothing, 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 nothing. That's zero. See, here's the here's the number one. One of these. Here's the number two. One of these. None of these. But you see that switches being up and down, uh, lights being on and off, is uh, very unfriendly to the human eye. So what we need is a binary coded decimal, okay, which has four inputs, usually referred to as A, B, C, and D. And you make a box, which will be a B, C, D binary coded decimal to seven segment decoder. Okay, and there's something in this box that will take these switches and light up seven LEDs in the right combination. Okay, this is called a seven segment display. There's seven LEDs. This LED is called A, this is called B, this is called C, D, E, F, and G. So if I want to show the number zero, I will light up A, B, C, D, E, and F. 
I will lead ye out. If I want to light up the number one, I would light up B and C. The number two, A, B, G, E, and D, etc. The number eight, they're all lit. Okay. The number nine, they're all lit except B, E. So you need a logic circuit in here that will take these combinations of switches and display in this way. Now you see this is much more friendly to the human eye. It looks like the number. So I will show you in 1937 uh, and 1938 here in the 30s how, and here's the gentleman name, Claude Shannon. There you go. Computers to the rescue. Thank you. So let's see how this works. Okay, well, in here, you see there are switches. And these all click together, these all click together. And uh, just to give you an idea of what a... A relay is. Okay, here's a relay. You see? When the switch closes, it, when the switch is open, it goes to one through when it closes it goes to another through okay so here is a this uh, this section here that doesn't move it's called the pole and there's two con possible connections one when it's activated this is the normally on this is the normally off and there's a spring that pulls this back when the electromagnet here releases it. Okay, so this is a, that's a relay. Okay, it works like this. You have, you have a pole, and then you have the normally on and the normally off connection. And you could, operate this by hand, this would be a single pole, a double, and now here there's a, this, you will see this written as throw, and you will see it written as through. And take your choice. Do you throw something? I, I think it's, a, you go through this way or you go through this way, so I think that's a better choice. So it's a single pole, double through. There's two ways to get through. You can operate this by hand, or, you see, you can operate this by taking an electromagnet, like so, and you can, if you close the switch, you pull this down, and if you let go of the switch, there's a spring that pulls it back up. So this is the normally closed, and this is the normally open positions. Okay? So in the 30s, they had relays. Now the relays they had in the 30s and the 40s were rather large. And okay? these guys here okay, are the modern version of the relay. The, the ones they had at that time were like the size of a, of a light bulb. Okay? And they were very noisy. So if you heard 42 relays engaging and disengaging at the same time, uh, you would need a uh, box. It was very loud. So let me show you how they would implement this in the 30s and the 40s. And here is, I built this circuit. And I will also simulate it for you. And let's see, where is it? Uh, right here. Okay. You need all these single pole double throw switches. Uh, all these switches are worth one, that's the A. All these switches are worth two, that's the B. All these switches are worth four, that's the C. And all these switches are worth eight. And I uh, made them so that they all work together. In 
using the hard wiring of this problem, I connected all of the all of the uh, uh, electromagnets, all of the coils together for each one of the of the inputs. A, B, C, D. This particular simulation was done in circuit maker, which uh, you see it's uh, nice because it gives you all these little bells and whistles. And it also has a, a seven segment display here and that's connected to these switches. Okay? So let me show you, first let me count on the simulator. Okay? Well here is zero. Here is, whoops, I have to turn it on, I'm sorry. Okay. Here is one. Here is two. And two and one is three. Here is four. Four and one is five. Four and two is six. Four, two and one is seven. And here's eight. And eight and one is nine. And you see it's a DCD to seven segment decoder. And it, the, the, the decoding goes into a decimal system, and the highest count in the decimal system is a nine. And now let me show you how the actual circuit works. Okay? The hardwire circuit over there. And hopefully I won't be embarrassed. Okay. There's always that chance. Okay, so you see the zero. Now I'm going to put up the A switch. Okay. So you see when I put up the A switch, okay, all of these relays clicked in. And this is what happened. Okay. This is what happened. These guys clicked in. All of these clicked in. We had a microphone I could put in there and you would hear it. Okay. They all clicked in. So, uh, let's, uh, let's put up the number five. Four and one. Right here. So, over here you see this switch is a one, this switch is a two, this switch is a four. So I'm going to uh, Okay, so see, four and one is five. So what happened now is that uh, the four, the one, and the four relays got activated. And you can see what goes on here. Look, you can see here. Uh, look at the eight. Goes through here, goes through here, goes through here, but then it stops. You see, it can't get there. So that's that. This one here, okay, goes through here, goes through here, goes through here, goes through here, and bingo, this one makes it through. So the four switch makes it through. Okay, the two switch, okay. Okay, the two goes three, 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 it stops right here. So the these control each segment, okay, and the segments are, let's see. So here it's uh, the A, B, C, D, E, F, and G segment. And you can see that uh, they're on or off depending on whether you feed through. Now, this seems rather uh, monumental. How in the world would you design this? And uh, there was a gentleman who was doing uh, graduate work at Brooklyn Poly in the 60s. And they were Scheinman. And he developed a very easy method of designing uh, any combination of logic circuit simply by single pole double throw switches like this. So anyway, this is 1930s, 1940s. You see mechanical, mechanical stuff. Okay? Hardly uh, small. 
hardly pocket size. So then, let's continue and uh, let's see what happens here. And here's this guy, Claude Shannon, that uh, in uh, 1938, see, master's thesis on MIT, published uh, symbolic analysis of relay and switching circuits, and he's the man that uh, recognized that what uh, George Bull invented as a game in uh, 19, in 18, what? Where, where did he, uh, 1854, okay? It took until 1938 for somebody to see that what he invented as a game really is going to revolutionize digital circuits, okay? All right, so let's continue here and see what this is, uh, not that. Here's page two of the history. Hello. Hello. Okay, 1942. This gentleman here, Tanaso, Iowa State, completes a simple electronic computing machine. It's probably the size of his room, okay? And it probably didn't do too much. And they forgot to put in here, that's my birthday. <laughs> they forgot Brooklyn at this point. Yeah. <laughs> IBM, for Harvard Mark I, large electromechanical calculator. Relay switches. Okay. The guy turning the wheel. 1944-45, Eckerd, this gentleman, Oakley, designed the ENIAC. The Moore School of Electrical Engineering, University of Penn, first fully functional electronic calculator. You go on the internet and you look up uh, this uh, acronym ENIAC or ENIAC, and you will see the pictures of this vacuum tubes and stuff. I think the failure rate was like uh, one vacuum tube every half an hour or something. So the thing would uh, run for a few minutes and the vacuum tube would go, so change the thing. Well, first they had to let it cool down, okay? otherwise, uh, so that was uh, 19, uh, as recently, see here, 1945, okay? 46, Newman, okay, consulted uh, the four stars, 47, Bretain, Bardeen, and Shockley invented the transistor. Well, that's not really true. Okay, there was a gentleman in the 30s who was left out of this thing in, in, uh, in Canada. Okay, his name was Lillenfeld. He has patents for the bipolar, the junction, the MOSFET transistors, but as you can see from that chart, at that time they had a hard time making light bulbs work. So this business with the uh, solid state, uh, he was way ahead of his time in ideas. <clears throat> Technology wasn't up to it. What these three gentlemen did uh, was they made a, they made a, uh, a uh, transistor that could be implemented in uh, industry, that could be produced industrially for large applications, okay. and they got the Nobel Prize for that. Okay, so they did not get the Nobel Prize for inventing the transistor, they got the Nobel Prize for developing an industrial, industrially viable unit. Okay. And uh, one of these days we'll show you, uh, there's a big controversy here, we have a, a, a video called Transistorized, which one will show you at one of these meetings. Very interesting here. And this, uh, this gentleman here, Shockley, was the, uh, the manager, he was the boss. Right? These two guys here worked for him. He was trying to develop the junction field effect transistor. And uh, it didn't, couldn't make it work. He couldn't make it work. So 
he says, hey, these companions, this is at Berlin. And in the, like, 46 or so, uh, says, hey, Bardeen with Tain, come here. You're not doing anything anyway. Here, solve this problem. And in the solution of the, of the problem of the JFET, they came up with this, with the BJT, with the, with the bipolar junction transistor. So they really invented, they really discovered it, so to speak, by, by accident, quite by accident. And then when they said, okay, the newspapers are coming, uh, everybody down for a picture, because you'll see this picture on, uh, all over the place, uh, you see the Bardeen and Retainer over here, and what did Chocolate do? He went there and sat down and picked up the probes. So the picture that you see is uh, Shockley, she looked like Shockley did it. Shockley was in his office all the time, and the other two guys did it. So anyway, they, they didn't like that very much. So there's a, there's a whole big controversy here. Is, uh, but anyway, the three of them got the Nobel Prize. Anyway, look what we got, they did that. They can fight some other place. Okay, 1948, first Lord program. 1951, Univac, okay, 1953, first electronic computer, 1953, the 701, delivered. 58, Jack Kilby, Texas Instruments, he built the first IC. Uh, this is a very interesting story here. Jack Kilby never used a computer, didn't care to use a computer. Yeah, it's like you guys. I don't want to use a computer. He invented the integrated circuit, but he wasn't interested in anything else. Yeah. So he actually invented the first IC, okay, and then uh, Texas built on his work. Texas Instruments was one of the first companies that started building uh, digital integrated circuits. Yeah. TTL, transistor, transistor logic, uh, and stuff like that. Okay? So uh, then this gentleman here, Noyce, okay, founded Fairchild Semiconductors, produced <coughs> and explained a process of integrated circuits. In other words, from this point on, things became solid state and became smaller and smaller and smaller and faster and faster and faster. Okay? 1963, first mini computer, Digital Equipment Corporation. Okay? 1964, System 360, mainframe computer by, uh, by uh, IBM. Okay? And then 1965, this gentleman, Gordon Moore, predicted that the number of components in an integrated chip would continue to double each year. This became known as Moore's Law. Well, here is a picture of his law. Uh, okay. So Moore's Law, again, I got this from Pascal and Hannah. Uh, he did a, a graph, and then he extrapolated the graph, and you can see that it's almost a linear relationship. And the idea here was that uh, every year the thing would double. So you see that in 1964, there were uh, 80 transistors. And then he said that as you go, boom, this thing would go up. The following, in 1975, and okay, 10 years later, he modified it a little bit because industry didn't go exactly like that. It, uh, you see the 8080, the 286, the 486, the Pentium, the Pentium 2, the Pentium 4, and it's kind of a straight line, but it doubled. Here he predicted that the thing
rate would double every year, and here it actually turned out that it kind of doubled every two years. Okay. So you see that the number of transistors that they can integrate uh, is now in the, in the millions. Yeah. So this is known as Moore's law. Okay, so now here we have uh, okay, in 1969, IBM has a first uh, programmable logic array. In okay, 71, this gentleman Hoff, engineer at Intel, invented the, developed the first microprocessor in 1971. It's not too far back. In okay. 1975, Intersil produced the first FPLA, the Field Programmable Logic Array. Okay. 1978, a company called Monolithic Memories developed something called the PAL. Okay. Now, what these are, say in in the 60s and the 70s, Texas Instruments and other uh, companies started making all the logic gates in the form of integrated circuits of these chips, which were in the form of TTL, transistor transistor logic. Okay? And uh, I have built for you the same circuit. Okay, this circuit, as it would have been built in uh, 1970. Okay. You see, each one of these, and I'm sure you're familiar with these, you play with them, okay. they are transistor transistor logic. Okay. And uh, let me show you the circuit that uh, needed to be interconnected. Here it is. Okay. Here's the four switches. Here's the gates that will do the logic. And this controls the A, this controls the B, the C, the D, the E, the F, and the G. LED. The A, the B, the C, the D, the E, the F, and the G. Okay. Right here. Okay. So let me show you how this one works. And uh, hopefully it'll, it'll work. Okay. Here's zero, okay. one, etc. Okay. So this is 1970, right here. Solid state. Each one of these has a certain number of gates in them. Each one of these gates, for example, this one here has about five transistors in it. By the late 70s, they took all of this stuff and they made it one chip. It was called the 7447. And they took all of that circuitry that you see over there and they put it into one chip. And it has one, two, three, four inputs and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven outputs. So all of that circuitry got integrated into one chip. So it's getting, it got smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, now, uh, what happened in, by the 1980s, you see 1984, 
this company called Zillink uh, made what is called a FPGA. Okay, an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. This is a field programmable game array. And what this is, is not real electronics. There's no transistors. There's no diodes, there's no resistors. What's inside this chip is a, their lookup tables. So if you want to do an AND function, there's a lookup table that relates these inputs to that output. Lookup tables. So you will see they're called LUTs, L U T S. So actually, inside this particular chip, which I have right here, this is a FPGA. It's mounted on this board so I can talk to it with switches and I can see results. Okay. And this is uh, simply a uh, amorphous, it has no shape. Okay. And uh, I forgot to bring in my little demo. So if you want to hold on a second, I'll be right back. I left it in the room. And uh, you'll be okay if you're gone. So here's a little... Here's the idea of a, of a field programmable data array. You see, it's nothing. You see, it's blank. There's nothing in there. Okay? Now watch. Okay. You ready? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can make it anything I want. <laughs> and then I can erase. Okay. Here it is. <laughs> Was this one? <laughs> okay, joke time. It reminded me of a joke. I don't know if you ever heard, there was a professor of, of anatomy at a medical school. And he got all the freshmen. They're all over the They got to get a name in this course, otherwise they don't go on. So they go in there and he do this cat or cadaver over there, this stuff, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, a doctor must have three, three very, very important characters. First of all, says, you have to be very observant. You have to observe everything because you don't know uh, how you can use later something that you observe now. So you have to be very observant when you do surgery. Observe. Number two, uh, you can't be uh, uh, you can't be grossed out by anything because you'll see all sorts of stuff. Over there, okay? And number three, you have to follow rules. Right? For example, you see. Uh, Right now, so watch this. Okay? He goes over to the cadaver and he sticks his finger in the, the rear end. And then he sticks the finger in his mouth. <laughs> Everybody goes, oh my god. He says, okay, you want to pass the scores? Come on up and do it. <laughs> So everybody, of course, wanted to continue their education and become a doctor, make millions of dollars, etc. So one by one, they all, uh, 
Okay, then he said, that's very good, that so you're following instructions. And most of you were engrossed out too bad. He says, now comes the very important point that I made first. He says, you have to be very observant. He says, I hope that you observe that I inserted this finger and I sucked on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have to be... Okay, so here it is. So you have to be very observant. So you see, this is nothing. Okay? And you can make it anything you want, you see? Like this, like this, and then you can reset it, okay? All right? So that's what a field programmable gate array is, an FPGA. It's a piece of wood that in the right hands can become a statue, can become, a, you can carve it, you can make it anything you want. Or better, a piece of clay, because then you can jumble it together and start again. Okay? So that's what this is here, a field programmable gate array. This guy right here, it's about one inch square, has 100,000 gates. 100,000 gates. Uh, you can go into 10 million gates. So now the problem here is that the circuitry, you see, uh, this one here, well, I showed it to you, it looked like complicated, there's nothing, maybe, I don't know, maybe 30 gates. That's nothing, we're talking about 100,000 gates. So you see that the problem nowadays is that there's no individual there's no company, then there's not enough time to sit there and draw a hundred thousand gates, draw a circuit that big. You can't do that. So what is done is you talk to these using a language. Okay? Using a language. So there's three ways of talking to this, and this is modern digital electronics. This is how you do it today. You can uh, actually draw the schematic. Okay? You can, uh, there's a software that allows you to draw the schematic. The schema then the software takes your schematic drawing and produces a bit file. Okay, so this is a, the name of your file. And it has the extension dot bit. And the instructions that are in here then go into the FPGA and make it whatever this is. Okay? Just like I so just like I did this here, is it? I did this. Okay? That does the same thing to the FPGA. Okay. It programs. Okay. But if you do one or two of these, you will see that it's very tedious. And after a while, there's not enough room to put in here. And you don't want to stay there a long time to do this. So what you do is you use a hardware programming language. Okay, or it's not really a programming language. It's a hardware description language. Okay, and this is called HDL. If you take an ET540 or 510, your textbook is da, 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 with HDL, which is hardware description language. This hardware description language is based on a programming language called ADA, ADA. It has the structure of ADA, it has the um, uh, it, it has the uh, 
syntax of Ada, but it's not Ada, and it's not a programming language. It's a hardware description language. It works differently. Okay, and the popular one now is VHDL. V stands for a very high speed integrated circuit. So here you have an acronym within an acronym. <laughs> so it's a very high speed integrated circuit hardware description language. Okay? There's another language, okay, and uh, that's similar to this, but it's different. It's called very long. And some people like this one, and some people like this one. They're both uh, used. They're both okay? IEEE certified, etc., etc. Now, uh, so if the circuit is small, well, you can draw the schematic. If the circuit is a little bigger, then you would actually use either this language or this language to program your FPGA. For example, uh, if this is A, this is B, and this is Y, in the first case, you would draw this. Okay? In the second case, you would say that Y gets assigned A and this. And you can see that this is much easier than this. So this is okay if you have, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 equations. And stuff. But even then it becomes, uh, let's say you, you're at 100,000 gates. <laughs> you got a lot of this stuff. So then in that case, uh, you would actually not use either one of these. You would draw the state diagram of the problem that you want. And then the software will write the, either the very log or the HDL version of that and implement it in that PGA. Okay? So, at uh, the last demonstration here, okay, let me show you. Okay, this is a, a board that has the SPGA here. This is a 100,000 gate array. And you can see that. Uh, it doesn't do anything because the switches, the LEDs, and the seven segment display are connected to this, but it's like this. <coughs> Excuse me. There's nothing there. So now what do I have to do here? Well, I have to do this, you see. I have to program it. Now, how do I program it? Well, here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equations. I have an equation that controls the A segment, one for B, one for C, etc. So there's seven equations. <coughs> so if I, I can uh, I can draw the circuit. <coughs> Excuse me. The circuit that I showed you before. Okay, I can uh, I can draw that. So I can come here and see and uh, let's see piece by student schematics <coughs> file and I can draw this. It'll take me about half an hour. I can draw that. Or I can write the equations. 
I can write the seven equations. I can use this. And that's probably what I would do here. I would either draw it or write the equation. Because this is for a really, really big circuit. Okay? And uh, I would compile it. The software would generate this bit file. And then once I have the bit file, I have to put the bit file in there so it would actually program this thing here. And I have done that if my computer didn't quit. And you can see here, okay, let me show you, can you see that? Okay. Is that all right? Can I go down or am I breaking this? Okay, now watch this. You see, I, I'm going to move the switches up and down and you will see that nothing happens. Why? Because it hasn't been programmed. <clears throat> now I'm going to use a piece of software that can take my bit file and program that field programmable gate array. So first, you have to initialize the chain which means that the computer has to know that this board is connected through the USB port. So there it is. So the computer now knows that the board is connected. Then you go to where you have this <coughs> file store. Okay. Oh, you didn't see that, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So now I have brought the file into, into this particular program. And now I will program this chain. Okay, so now what happened is that the, this bit file went into the chain. And there it is. You see, now it's, now it's working. Zero. Here. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So this field programmable gate array will retain this, see, it will retain this in memory until you remove the power. You just forgot everything. In other words, everything, all those nails went back down. Reconnect it. Clear it. I will initiate, let the computer recognize it. Go get that file. Program it. Okay. Now it knows it again. Okay. Now you say, well, gee, that's a pain. Uh, every time you remove power, you forget. Well, you have two choices. There's a little jumper here. Uh, you can uh, you can either have it in what is called a JTAG position. Uh, that means that when you remove the power, it forgets. Or you can put it as a ROM, read-only memory position. So it won't forget. It will only forget if you erase it. So those are the two possibilities here. So what I have done here, you see, this, uh, this has, this FPGA has 100,000 gates. And I, this example right here, I use this much of it. <laughs> That's it. And so, if you want to compare the uh, the guys that were getting all those bonuses with uh, what we got, okay. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is about this much, or maybe even less. Maybe it's a little bit. 
Okay, so you see the, the evolution of uh, digital circuitry. You see it went from relays, mechanical stuff, to vacuum tubes, to small scale integration. Then that went to medium scale integration. And today you're in this, you're not even in integration because in here there are no transistors, there are no uh, diodes, okay? This, there's only lookup tables. Of course, what we left out, okay, because otherwise we'd be here too long. And anyway, we, we ran out of pizza. We left out the microprocessors, the FPGAs, the PLAs, etc. Okay, so there are other steps in between that we left out. But I wanted to show you the three main developments. Okay, what was mechanical? Then we went into small-scale integration, and today we are in these field programmable gate arrays that are monumental. You can do basically anything you want with them. So I hope you didn't get uh, too bored, and uh, thank you for your attention. And next time we'll try to have better pizza. How about ice cream next time?